Bismillah. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa lah amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah. So the last few ayat we were covering uh, in our last session was wa huwa al-ghafurul wadud dhul arsh al-majid and then we reached finally ba'd of shamim fa'al lima yurid Allah Ta'ala says what fa'al lima yurid. So the, 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 the term fa'il, ism fa'il, right? Uh, the fa'il means a doer. Fa'al is the hyperbolized, mubalaha form, implying what? Over and over and over again, the one who does. And fa'alu lima yurid, he, the one who does whatever he wants again and again and again. This verse is to remind us that even though Allah Ta'ala, wa huwa al ghafurul wadud, right? He is the most loving and forgiving. You don't want to take advantage. You know, some people, you know, the expression, uh, don't mistake my kindness for weakness, right? Oh, he's so loving, I'll just do whatever I want. No. You still have to maintain respect. Dhul Arsh al Majid. He's from the highest, most noble, uh, from above the, the throne, subhanAllah. So you have to always have that respect. And also, what? That we can't force Allah Ta'ala to do anything. Fa'alu lima yurid. He does whatever he wants. So even though, you know, sometimes you think, oh, this person loves me, I can manipulate them. It doesn't work like that. It's not that Allah's job to submit to what we want. It's rather what? That we submit to what he wants. That is the whole essence of Islam, submission. You could read it, uh, this, these two ayat, in a slightly different way. You could say, uh, uh, arsh, and then pause. And I've heard some reciters do it this way. Arsh, that Allah Ta'ala is the, the owner of the throne. Al-Majidu fa'alu lima yurid. Which means what? That the most majestic, Allah Ta'ala, is the one who does whatever he wants. He is constantly doing whatever he wants. So this is another way of reading it, which is, you know, it gives a slightly different meaning, but uh, it's still along the same lines. Uh, what is the difference between this concept of irada, which means Allah's will, and al mashia which is also Allah's will? We find ayat like, inna Allah yaf'alu ma yurid, Allah does whatever he wants. You also find, inna Allah yaf'alu ma yasha, Allah does whatever he wants. So in English, whatever he wants, whatever he wants, or whatever he wills. What's the difference? What's the difference between irada and mashia? So some scholars just say straight up, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I tried to do a little bit of research on this and I came across some statements that were like, we just don't know. But I came across one statement which was um, interesting. Al-Askari rahimahullah said what? Al-farqu bayna al-irada wal mashia anna al-irada tatakunu lima yataraha waqtuhu wa lima la yataraha wal mashiatu lima lam yataraha that the difference between irada and mashia, irada is for when someone wants to take their time or when they don't want to take their time, whereas mashia, it's only uh, when there's no delay, when there's no delay. So, and this is really appropriate and fitting, you know, it's, it's very specific wording because fa'alu uh, lima yurid, he's the one who does whatever he wants and it could imply the, the fact that Allah used yurid instead of yasha implies what? That there could be a delay. And the context of this surah is exactly what? The believers wondering, Ya Allah, we were put to fire, we were burned, why didn't you miraculously come down and save us? And Allah is saying, I could do whatever I want and he used the verb that can include immediately or after a time. And we're going to see how that also connects to the different examples of different uh, 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 disbelieving nations that are going to be mentioned in a second. Again, the concept of what? I'm, I can give them time, but still at the end of the day, what I want to do, what I want to happen is going to happen. Even if it's not on your timeline, it is on mine. Yes, in this life, the more powerful king uh, uh, the more powerful a king becomes, the more ruthless they usually become. Allah Ta'ala is the most high, Dhul Arsh al Majid, and He's the most capable, Fa'alu lima yurid, yet that doesn't translate into tyranny, rather, He is what? Wahuwa al Ghafurul Wadud, He is forgiving and loving. It's as if Allah Ta'ala is saying, I can do whatever I want and I choose to be loving. It's not like I have to be. I can do whatever I want and yet I still choose love. And this is very similar to the prophetic statement in which the Prophet says that Allah says in a hadith Qudsi, إِنِّي حَرَّمْتُ عَلَى نَفْسِي الظُّلْمُ وَعَلَى عِبَادِي فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا Indeed, I have made oppression unlawful on myself. I have forbidden myself from doing zulm and oppression. And for my servants as well. My servants, uh, I've, I have uh, uh, forbidden it for them as well. So do not oppress one another. فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا Do not oppress one another. Uh, this uh, word fa'alun, describing Allah as the one who can do whatever he wants, occurs twice in the Quran, once in Surah Hud, when Allah says, uh, Inna rabbaka fa'alu lima yurid. Indeed, your Lord is the one who does whatever he wants. And if Allah Ta'ala used the, the, the term fa'il, the doer, it still would have meant that he does whatever he wants. What's the difference though? It could have meant that he does whatever he wants rarely. He does whatever he wants, but rarely. In other words, what? He rarely gets involved. Like, I can do whatever I want all the time, but I just rarely get involved in human affairs. You know, I don't really pay much attention to them. However, the word fa'alun implies that he is constantly involved. Allah Ta'ala is constantly involved. That yes, I can do whatever I want, and I'm, uh, usu I'm 
constantly using that power, giving life, giving death, giving sustenance, giving guidance, rewarding, punishing, etc. Kullu yawmin huwa fi sha'n. As Allah Ta'ala mentions, he is uh, every day, and some translate this as every moment, he is in some sort of an affair. Allah Ta'ala is constantly within our reality. We don't believe that Allah Ta'ala is, you know, like some people, they, they, they think the, you know, like a watchmaker, he just designed this universe and then just left and ignored it and just said, oh, whatever, you know, whatever's happening, let it just run according like a clock. That's fine. I'm not interested. No, we don't believe that. We believe that Allah Ta'ala controls everything. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Every movement, every moment Allah Ta'ala is involved. And of course, there are two types of irada. Irada al sharia and al irada al kawniya uh, Two types of will that Allah Ta'ala has. Allah Ta'ala wants for us what? al irada al sharia is what Allah Ta'ala wants for us in terms of the sharia. But he doesn't enforce it. Like for example, Allah Ta'ala says, you know, you should pray five times a day, you should fast the month of Ramadan, you should give charity. This is what Allah wants, but he doesn't enforce it. Those who want to accept, uh, uh, they, 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 they do so. Uh, what's it called? Um, whoever wants, he can... Uh, what's the ayah? فليكفر. What's it say again? من شاء فليؤمن ومن شاء فليكفر. What that's the, is that the ayah? It's in Surah Surah uh, Kaf. I'm, I'm forgetting. But anyway, Allah Taala Alam. If someone can help me out. But anyway, you guys know the ayah I'm talking about. من شاء من شاء. Yeah. من شاء فليؤمن ومن شاء فليكفر. Yeah. Now. جزاكم الله خيرا. شكرا. بارك الله فيكم. So uh, that's the irada al sharia. However. There's al irada al kawniya, which is what? Allah Ta'ala's will with regards to the universe and how it runs. Nobody can deny this. Nobody can oppose this. The sun coming up and the sun going down, when it comes to you know, planting a seed and it grows, this is just what Allah Ta'ala has designed. And so these are the two differences. Now, this is a really beautiful point. I want us all to pay attention to this. If you pay attention from ayah number 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, just this whole section right here, imagine this as a conversation between Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala and the uh, uh, martyrs, because we just talked about how these people were gathered up, they were burned, and Allah said, I'm gonna punish those who didn't repent, and I'm gonna give those who believed uh, their paradise. And then after that, Allah says what? In Indeed, the uh, uh, anger of your Lord uh, is, is indeed seven, uh, severe. As in saying what? It's as if Allah Ta'ala is speaking to the, the martyr and saying, listen, I hate what they did to you. What they did to you, the way they mistreated you, I, you think that I don't care? You think that I'm just passive? No, I actually hate what they did to you. But he's the one who, what, he starts things and then he repeats it. In other words, Allah is saying to the martyr, he's saying what? But just as I created you, I can bring you back. I don't like the fact that they killed you, but guess what? I created you the first time and I can bring you back a second time. And he is the all-forgiving and the most loving. In other words, he's still speaking to this martyr and saying what? I hate what they did to you, but don't worry. Just as I created you, I can bring you back. And then after that, I can forgive all of your sins and I will intensely love you. And he is the owner of the highest throne, of this majestic throne, saying what? I'm not just going to love you back in this dunya. No, not in this lowly life, in this lowly earth. No, but in the lost, loftiest, in the highest of stations. Why? Because I can do whatever I want. So subhanAllah, when you look at these uh, uh, five ayat all together and take them as a personalized message to the martyrs, subhanAllah, it is so beautiful and so perfect as a statement saying, listen, you think that I was just passively watching what these people did to you? No, I hate what they did to you, but I can, just as I created you, I can bring you back. Yes, you died as a martyr, but I can bring you back and I can forgive your sins and, 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 and love you intensely, not here, but in the best of places because I can do whatever I want. This message is so personalized and so beautiful. And what is the evidence that Allah Ta'ala can do whatever he wants? What is the evidence? Look at the next verse. Has there reached you the story of the soldiers? Don't you know about what happened to previous... So Allah Ta'ala doesn't mention who are the junood. So the, 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 the ayah just stops there. Immediately making you think, wait a second, which soldiers are you talking about? And so by stopping here, it grabs the attention of the audience, making them think that perhaps this is referring to armies that are currently on the way. Maybe this is talking about the Quraysh, right? Because the Prophet is reciting these ayat. Have you heard what happened to these soldiers? Which soldiers? Are they on the way? Are they coming? These ones right here? Which soldiers are we talking about? And the word jund means a professional fighter, means, uh, 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 refers to uh, professional fighters, whereas jaysh and askar refer, uh, uh, can, be, can be full of untrained and civilian soldiers. So jund here is referring to what? The professional type of fighters, those who are well trained. So Allah Ta'ala is saying, have you heard the narration and the news about what happened to those professional soldiers, those who were well trained? And then Allah Ta'ala stops. Why? Because this can apply to all governments. This can apply to throughout history. Whatever type of oppressive governments there have been or will be, this is all relevant. But then Allah Ta'ala specifies, now that the pause is over, Fir'aun wa Thamud. Allah Ta'ala says, no, specifically who am I talking about? Fir'aun. 
as in yani, the people of Fir'aun, the, the disbelievers, and Thamud, as in the people who opposed Salih alayhi salam. Allah Ta'ala is right, reminding the disbelievers that he destroyed armies greater than them. So the, the Quraysh are listening. And Allah is saying, what, you, you don't think that I'm fa'alun ma yurid, that I can do whatever I want? Of course I can do whatever I want. Haven't you seen what I've done to nations that were worse and bigger and more dangerous than you? And why single out Fir'aun and Thamud specifically? Allah Ta'ala could have mentioned the people of Nuh السلام, the people of Lut Allah Ta'ala could have mentioned many different uh, people that were destroyed. Perhaps it's because, and this is again going back to the idea of at taraqi giving delay, right? Why was it Yurid instead of Yasha? Maybe Allah Adam, because one implies that there can be a delay. And here too, Fir'aun, how many chances was he given? Musa السلام, would come with these miracles and show these plagues and so on and so forth. All these different things came to Musa السلام, so miracle after miracle that Fir'aun could have believed in. He was given so many chances and at the end of the day, he still uh, didn't believe and he even chased them into a miracle, the water being parted. SubhanAllah, imagine the level of arrogance. Thamud, they were given three days, right? Didn't Salih السلام, tell them, listen, you're going to have three days before the punishment comes. And they, oh, they thought it was funny and they laughed about it and they joked about it and, and at the end of the day what happened? They were all destroyed. And this is referring to who? The soldiers around Ashab al around the uh, trenches. Uh, and they had their whole lives to repent. Allah Ta'ala mentions that they lived their whole life and they never made tawbah for what they did. So all these cases, Wallahu Alam, seem to be referring to delays. In other words, the believers are asking, why doesn't Allah Ta'ala punish them immediately? And it's as if Allah Ta'ala is saying, many criminals were given extra time to repent, yet they didn't change. And uh, they're getting exactly what they deserve now. The people of Fir'aun, they're getting what they deserve now. They're being punished now. What about the people of Thamud? Same thing. So these criminals are, and same thing with the Ashab al-Ukhdud. So same thing with these people. Uh, again, this is a, a reassurance to the believers living in Mecca that are being oppressed by the Quraysh. That no, even if it comes, even if it delays, if it takes time, we still have to be patient. And again, perhaps the two groups that are being mentioned, uh, Fir'aun and Thamud, it's because, think about the audiences. The Prophet ﷺ was speaking to a number of audiences. One was the Yahud, and the Yahud, the Jews, would be the most familiar with who? Fir'aun. And then the pagan Arabs, the Mushrikeen, they would be most familiar with who? Thamud. And furthermore, what about the Christians, you might say? Well, these uh, Ashab al-Ukhdud, they were known to be believers in who? In Isa alayhi salam. So the Christians would be familiar with this story of Ashab al-Ukhdud. So it seems to be covering all the bases. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Allah then says, kafaru fi takdeeb. Rather, those who have disbelieved are in denial. After being reminded of the history of these past wicked nations, the disbelievers should be sufficiently warned. These Quraysh should be warned. You've been t all these different groups have been taken care of before. You're going to be taken care of as well. Yet, those who disbelieve are in denial. It's as if they're saying, oh, it happened to them, but I'm different. It won't happen to me. So Allah Ta'ala addresses that private thought by saying, Bel, no, you're wrong. You think to yourself, yeah, yeah, that happened before, but not us. Not us, right? Some people have this attitude. Oh, it can happen to everybody else, but not me. I'm special. It doesn't work like that. Allah Ta'ala's sunnah is Allah Ta'ala's sunnah. You get to a certain point of disbelief, you're going to be punished. So this denial, Bel. No, you're denying. Alladina kafaru fi takdeeb. Those who disbelieve are in fi takdeeb. This is different than what? This is different than saying bali alladina kafaru yukadhibun, as Allah Ta'ala mentions in uh, the next surah that we're going to be covering in Shah Ta'ala. Yukadhibun is the verb, but fi takdeeb is using the mustar. And so it's a much more heavy fi takdeeb you are drowning in, you are submerged in. In what denial? So there's a difference between saying you're denying versus you are completely immersed in denial. So this is a much more, you could say, a, a, a powerful statement. Yes, this verse could be changing the subject from Fir'aun and Thamud back to the Quraysh and saying how they're similar to these great historical examples of disbelief. And this is called Al-Iltifat, changing the direction, saying, no, you think you're, you're not like them? Rather, you're exactly like them, you're just denying it. And this is a very, very powerful reminder. And you know, we have to remind ourselves over and over again, the believer sees with a different lens. The believer sees the world with a different eye. And there's a very famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari in which the Prophet ﷺ, a man passed by the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, and then he asked the people that were sitting with him, what's your opinion about this person? And they said, oh, he's from the noble class of people. By Allah, if he should ask for a woman in marriage, he'd get married. And, and, and if he interceded for somebody, then his intercession would be accepted. And then the Prophet remained quiet. Then a different person passed by. And then uh, the Prophet asked the same question, what do you think about this person? And they said, yeah, ya, o, o Rasulullah, ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa this person is of the poor Muslims. If he asks for marriage, no one's going to accept. If he intercedes on somebody's behalf, nobody's going to accept his intercession. If he talks, nobody's even going to listen to him. You know, somebody from not making much money, lowly, you know, whatever the case is. Somebody who's just given a low status. Then the Prophet says what? Hadha khayrun min mil al-ardi mithla hadha. Subhanallah. L listen to these words and try to imagine this. 
The Prophet says what? That, that, that poor one that, that everybody seems to just look over, nobody listens to his opinion, they just think, oh, you know, quiet, awkward, whatever the case is, just you know, somebody who's ignored, that one is a full earth, is, is, is better, that, 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 that guy who's underestimated is better than a, a, a world's worth, a full earth's worth of the other one. That guy that was so high status and so impressive and so this and that and the other. Why? Because the Prophet is saying, look, you guys are so impressed with this guy just because he has a little bit of money and because he has a little bit of status. You can have a full planet of people just like that guy. And guess what? It's not equivalent to one of this ones, that one of this individual, subhanAllah. This is a reminder that worldly status has no bearing on your position with Allah Ta'ala. So when you see the believers being thrown into a fire and then the disbelievers laughing and they have all the position and status and wealth, just know that this dunya is a place of testing and that ultimately none of that uh, determines your status with Allah Ta'ala. Then Allah says, Wallahu min wara'ihim muhit. While Allah Ta'ala is encompassing them from behind. And the word uh, wara' can mean both in front and behind. So SubhanAllah, it's one of those kalimat uh, al I think it's called, a word that can have um, op opposite meanings at times. So SubhanAllah, it's a very interesting word because it very much fits with the statement muhit. Muhit meaning all encompassing. So in the previous verse, we learned that the disbelievers were surrounding themselves or drowning in or submerged in what? Takdeeb in denial. And here we find that uh, we find uh, uh, that uh, they're surrounded and encompassed by what they are denying by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu min wara'ihim muhit. These people are completely surrounded by what they are denying, surrounded by Allah ta'ala. What is this referring to? Imagine a person who is entirely surrounded by an army, similar to the way Allah ta'ala is in full control, but they cover themselves with a blanket. Fi takdeeb, they're just denying. Does that make you safe? Oh, don't worry, I don't see them. I'm covering my eyes. Do you think you're safe? When you close your eyes, the world doesn't go away. So what does it imply that Allah Ta'ala is surrounding them? Well, this could be the fact that this whole planet, we live on the surface and it's completely exposed. That's why we can see the stars. So you can see how the end of the surah is going back to similar to the theme of the beginning, which is what? That, uh, that Allah Ta'ala is saying, uh, then Allah Ta'ala is talking about what? Talking about the, the skies and the heavens, just like the surah began with buruj. But anyway, we know that this whole planet, when you look down, when you look up, you see what? All these stars are looking down upon us. And we know that the angels are up there to the point that the Prophet described how in the heavens above, you can't, there's in, there isn't even a hand span of space where you don't have the malaika, worship, malaika worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's, it's so full. So everything around this planet is surrounding this planet is what? The malaika and Allah ta'ala, you know, just all looking at us. So you could, this could be a reference to what? The fact that Allah's power is completely all around us. We're surrounded from every direction. Yes, it could also refer to the fact that subhanAllah, Fir'aun was what? Surrounded by water. Wallahu min wara'ihim muhit. He was completely submerged in water. Thamud, where were they? Thamud thought they were safe because they were where? Where were Thamud? Where were they hiding? In what? Mountains, that's correct. They were from, uh, surrounded of the mountains. So they thought, nothing can harm me when I'm surrounded in mountains. That's the safest place to be. If there's a tornado, I'm inside of a cave. Tornadoes can't affect you. If there's a flood, we're in the highest position. If there's a, a, an earthquake, the mountains are the safest place to be. Right? Really, it's actually safer than a lot of the places we live today, to be honest with you. If there was an earthquake, this whole place would probably fall on our heads. But subhanAllah, in a mountain, you're probably in pretty good shape. So they're thinking to themselves, we're set. What's the one thing they weren't thinking about? Sound. a sayha Right? Allah Ta'ala sent them a sonic boom, essentially. Right? And we know nowadays that you can actually use sound as a weapon at a certain uh, amount of decibels. It can, it can shred up your insides. You, you, you vibrate at such a frequency that you completely get turned into mush. Everything just, just gets destroyed. That's the one thing that subhanAllah they weren't thinking about. That if uh, Jibreel السلام, screams at them and they has this sonic boom, well, that mountain is only going to echo even worse. <laughs> Subhanallah, right? If you're inside of a big, uh, you know, uh, mountains, then Subhanallah, the echo is going to be even worse, and it's going to make it even worse. So they're surrounded by the thing that's actually killing them. So Wallahu min wara'ihim muhit. That Allah Ta'ala is surrounding them by all sides and Allah Ta'ala is giving examples. This person was drowned, this person was surrounded by mountains that only made it a worse echo chamber and uh, uh, killed them even worse. And these other people, Allah Ta'ala described how they were being, being surrounded by the fire and we talked about that earlier. Uh, and Allah knows best, these people of Ashab al-Ukhdud. So yes, this can also refer to the fact that what? Allah Ta'ala encompasses everybody with his knowledge and Allah Ta'ala encompasses everybody with his judgment, either reward or punishment. Yes, uh, this is similar to the ayah, Inna rabbaka labil mirsad, indeed your Lord is you could say lying in wait, that Allah Ta'ala is in observation, a place, uh, a position to pounce, you could say, obviously, uh, in a way that befits His Majesty. Bal huwa Qur'an, last two ayat, inshaAllah. Bal huwa Qur'anum Majid. Then Allah says, no, rather, it is, it is, what is it? This, this whole statement, 
this whole surah, this whole message. It is what? Qur'anun majidun. And Allah Ta'ala is saying what? After being warned, the dis disbelievers are thinking, yeah, it's a good story, but maybe this is just nice poetry. So Allah Ta'ala responds to this thought, this inner thought that they're thinking when they're hearing this Qur'an, Allah responds, bal, no. Rather, actually, it's an honorable recital. As in what? You know the difference between truth and falsehood. And this doesn't resemble a lie at all. This Qur'an is conveying the most noble truth, so how could it then be a lie? SubhanAllah. And it's amazing that, uh, furthermore, this Qur'an is something that makes people transform into the most noble people. So how could something so noble, that makes people noble, how can you then say that it is a lie? SubhanAllah. And also, the fact that Allah used the word Majid, which is the same description as the throne, which is so high above. Dhul Arsh al-Majid. It's the Arsh, it's, they can't, it's unreachable. What does this imply? Just as Allah's majestic throne is untouchable by the kings of this earth, can any king on this earth go and try to conquer the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Obviously no. So in that same way, so too, Allah's majestic Qur'an is equally untouchable. The believer is going to think to himself, my death is acceptable, but my mission to spread the truth must go on. What if the, what if the disbelievers distort the Qur'an? And the answer is, don't worry, they can never distort it. As we're going to see in just a second. This is the greatest comfort to the believer because they, the believer puts the truth above their own lives. We have to ask ourselves, do we think in this way? Do we think to ourselves, my death, whatever, but I need this message to go on. Me, I'm, you know, I come, human beings, we all come and go, but the truth must stay forever, subhanAllah. This is the attitude of the believer. And Allah Ta'ala is reassuring that believer that this Qur'an will never be distorted. It is preserved beyond, way beyond their reach. The disbelievers want to kill the believers to get rid of them. Why? So they can get rid of the truth. But the Qur'an cannot be destroyed. The truth will remain. And even the believers who are martyred, they will just be returned back to their Lord for their ultimate reward. So in both ways, the disbeliever is losing. So how can the disbeliever deny the nobility of this Qur'an when it makes people the most noble of the noble? And the word Qur'an, it's in the pattern of Fu'lan, like Qurban. A Qurban is something that is sacrificed. It's the maf'ul. It's a, it's a style of maf'ul, something that is passive. And so in the same way, Qur'an can mean maqru. Ya'ni, the thing that is, since it's Qur'an, it's since hyperbolized, it's implying, implying what? It's implying the thing that is read the most. Bal huwa Qur'anun majid. Rather, this is this text that is read the most, and it is so noble. Yes, so that's what the word Qur'an means, for those who don't know. It means that which is read very, very often. So we should treat it like that which is read very, very often. We should fulfill the, the name of the Qur'an by treating it like something that is part of our lives, reading it every single day. And uh, perhaps some believers are wondering, how can they get closer to Allah Ta'ala al-Majid, near the, His throne, the majestic throne, if they're not being uh, oppressed by these martyrs? How can I also reach that status? Read this Qur'an because this Qur'an is majid. It'll make you more noble. It, uh, it is noble. The more you bring it into your life, the more noble you become. Fi lawhin mahfuz. Final ayah. You'll notice that these ayat all finished with qarqala. You know, they, finished, they were finishing, many of them were finishing with what? Bal huwa Qur'anun majid. You know, it's, it's, it's a heavy letter. But it's so beautiful that after all these heavy stops, then the last ayah is fi lawhin mahfuz. And it's not it's not it's not a qarqala letter. So subhanAllah, it finishes very calmly and very smoothly. It's a very a beautiful style to it. Uh, the word mahfuz can either be marfu' referring uh, to the Quran or majrur referring to the tablets. Al-lawhin mahfuz. Lawhin is the most common way of translating it. The word lawh, uh, you know, what, where is this lawh? Where is this preserved tablet? Uh, and most scholars, they would say, what? It's above the seven heavens where the shayateen could never reach. There are many, many ayat that talk about how this preserved tablet is also known as Ummul Kitab, the mother of all books. And this is mentioned in many ayat, how it is preserved. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. Indeed, we are those who sent down the Quran and indeed we will be its guardian. Yamahu Allahu ma yasha'u wa yuthbit wa indahu Ummul Kitab. Allah eliminates what he wills or he confirms and with him is the mother of the book. Uh, Allah Ta'ala talks about how this book is a what? Kitabun Aziz. It is a mighty, precious book. Allah Ta'ala says falsehood cannot approach it from, uh, from before it or from behind it. It is a revelation from the Lord uh, who is wise and praiseworthy. So there's so many ayat like this that talk about how Allah Ta'ala has preserved this book. And so with that, inshallah ta'ala, we uh, finish. 
and we ask Allah Ta'ala that just in the same way he has preserved his book, that we ask Allah Ta'ala that we, uh, we can memorize this book so he can preserve us as well. Uh, that we can bring this Qur'an into our lives, we can have it in our hearts, so Allah Ta'ala preserves and protects and keeps our hearts and our minds and ourselves uh, preserved and blessed as well. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who bring this Qur'an into our lives. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who constantly understand and see that your status in dunya does not reflect your status in the akhirah. May Allah Ta'ala put our emphasis on the akhirah and doing good. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who are willing uh, uh, to sacrifice for the truth and to make sure the truth continues on even if we will not. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazamtara khayran wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Any comments, points, feelings, thoughts, objections? <laughs> Did I go too long? Did I exhaust everyone? <laughs> Apologize. I didn't want to stop and then start the next one next week and then it'd just be very, very short. I figured I'd just finish it, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. Shukran.